What the cark happened in here? Emiliana said, her eyes darting between the features in the room as she stepped into the former office of Commissar Shadrick. Before her was the cooling corpse of his assigned aide from the Sisterhood, still laying on the ground nearly where she had fallen. Someone had dragged the dead sister just out of sight from the doorway, but she was plainly visible now that the corporal and her squad were in the room. Waiting outside and keeping a watch were the 40 other guardsmen that Stern had decided they may need in order to facilitate smooth compliance from the commissar captain they were seeking. Once collected, the large group had headed into the basilica to begin their search. They were mildly surprised by the lack of nearly any people within the saintly fortress, finding only the younger aides and scribes taking shelter there, as well as the non-combat patterned servitors used by the ecclesiarchy. For the sisters, it made sense. The vast majority of them were already outside, fighting in one way or another against the swelling rebel tide. But Shadrick's forces were nowhere to be seen either, despite being a far larger force than the 40 men the captain had decided to commandeer. Now, when they finally found his office, a lot of them were greeted not with the scowling face of the tall man they sought, but rather the slack yet surprised features of the cold, dead clerical aid. What do you think? Another Jedi assassin? Captain Stern asked, stroking his chin as he looked around, seeking another body or signs of combat. Sergeant Vetnek shook his head, hard purple eyes fixed on the dead woman at their feet. No, that's not a power sword wound. It's not even a blast wound for that matter, the short man said. Then what killed her? was the captain's follow-up question, a young voice answering him almost right away. Sir, said 1313, the Krieger stepping forward stiffly as he did. Laz rifle wound, hotshot variant with linked power pack. Said 1313, the young man not even needing to bend down to inspect the wound, more than familiar with that kind of weapon damage thanks to the live fire training he had endured before ever departing Krieg itself. The captain's face clouded, lines creasing his forehead. Is the plank right? Asked Stern, turning to Vetnex for the answer. The sergeant took a moment longer to inspect the mortal injury before looking up and nodding sharply. Stern's face took on a darker expression, and he nodded, stepping over her body and looking to the left and right of the nearby desk. Is it possible that one of the rebels got inside? Or a Jedi is using one of our own guns? Captain Stern pressed, waltzing over behind that desk now, moving with a slow, casual step. He checked for wires, traps, mines, both intended and improvised, face calm as he methodically cleared the space with his eyes before noticing that all of the cogitators that had been installed into the desk had been removed or disabled. No, I don't think so. This sister was Shadrick's aide. I saw her with him in the courtyard when he shot St. Lazarus said Emiliana, long last hefted under one arm, a pistol gripped in the other, held up and scanning along with her eyes as she entered the room more fully, wary of every nook and cranny. Unless she was ordered by her superior, this aide would not have left his sight or his side. If an assassin attacked here, they would have attacked Commissar Shadrick as well. On top of that, the Commissar Captain was marching around with an escort when he was dismissed by Her Holiness. I can't imagine he would send them away afterwards. Especially not now while we're in the middle of a carking siege, she concluded. Stern nodded again, placing his hands down on the desk before him and leaning on them as he sighed heavily through his nose. Yeah, I saw them too. Fracking redcoat. He almost spat. All right, let's not jump to conclusions. Scour the room. We need more clues as to what went on here and why. The captain ordered after a brief pause. That will be unnecessary," said an augmented, accented voice. The guardsmen in the room turned towards the door, finding a familiar female tech priest striding inside, torn and burnt red robes billowing behind her. None of them were fresh. All of them bore wounds, the tech priest herself included. Most notably, one of her arms had been severed, or rather, ejected just above her elbow at some point. The small cloud of servo skulls which trailed after her seemed diminished as well, but none of that appeared to have perturbed her as she confidently stepped forward, moving to the shape of her clerical, imperial counterpart. 
The dark-skinned captain stretched his face into a wry smile. Magos, it's good to see you're still alive, said Stern as she kneeled next to the corpse of the sister, megadendrite slithering over the tech priest's shoulders and under her arms, descending over the body of the dead woman like a waterfall composed of metal snakes. I think it's too late to save her. She's been dead for almost an hour, and there's no patching that, said Vetnix, stepping back to give the priest more space. Her life cannot be recovered, this is true, but her data may still exist. Her mission was not only to serve the Commissar, but to observe him as well. I doubt that she would have been doing so with only flesh eyes, and flesh ears, was the red-robed woman's answer. After a few moments, she released a mechanical sigh, something that sounded more like the release on a pressure valve than a human breath, and looked up at the captain behind the desk. I have it, she said. Have what, exactly? Emiliana asked, raising one eyebrow as she watched the incomprehensible work. Sister Tarmi had an audio recording implant installed to aid in her service. I have located it, here hidden in her left shoulder," said the Magos, stripping back the dead sister's vestments and cutting open her sleeve enough to expose the alleged enhancement, which merely resembled a normal human limb. It is finally made and hidden, no doubt the work of the Ofregan Augmenters Guild. I can interrogate it, stand by, processing," she informed them. The many mechadendrites found hidden, virtually invisible seams in the piece of hardware, sliding small filaments within the cracks and causing a short gust of pressurized air to release as the false shoulder revealed itself. The skin-like casing sliding up on small metal stands to expose the wiring and metallic structures which lay beneath. The Magos began to interface with it shortly, and the soldiers waited, looking around nervously. After a time, one of them spoke. What are we going to do? Asked Vetnex, crossing his thickly tattooed arms over his chest as he leaned against the cold metal wall. Do about what? Asked the captain, standing straight behind the desk, his eyes on the tech priest and her work. Vetnex's lip twitched before he replied, rubbing his neck as he began to speak. About the obvious. Captain, unless she comes back out of that shoulder with a very strange set of facts, then it seems pretty obvious to me what happened here," he said. Stern shifted his gaze from the busy Magos to the sergeant, eyes hard and narrow. Careful, sergeant. Be very careful. Commissar Captain Shadrick outranks everyone in this room, myself included. If any potentially insubordinate thoughts you might have drifting around your head make it out of your mouth, it could be a few lashes or a bolt to the head. Got it, said the captain his sergeant's face hardening but saying nothing more, only nodding sharply. They waited in tense silence then, the most at ease of all of them seeming to be the lone Krieger who stood among them. His face was perfectly calm and impassive, betraying no emotion, a second mask now that his first was hanging broken from around his neck. Are you really that calm, or do they just train you that way? Emiliana asked. The young guardsman nodded. Yes was 1313's quick reply, making the woman's eyebrows furrow in his direction. But before she could say or add anything else, the Mago stood up from her work, and all attention returned to her. Captain Stern, it is ready. I have excised the most relevant record from the data logs she had stored. It will contextualize what happened here. They are ready, and you may hear them now. She informed him. Stern twisted his neck to the left and to the right, eliciting a few pops and rubbing his hands together before nodding. All right, play it, said the captain, but she shook her head to deny him. This is for your ears only, captain. The Martian priestess said, extending her free hand and deploying two thickly wired earbuds from a small compartment in her remaining forearm. Grimacing at the implication, Stern nodded his head and came around the desk, taking the small buds and carefully placing them into each of his ears, listening. All those present watched his face, feeling the tension in the air as the captain overheard the last few minutes of the sister's life. Suddenly, something he heard hit him, his eyes slowly widening and then bulging. He yanked the earbuds out by their cords, 
a trickle of sweat sliding down his forehead and along his nose. Captain? Asked Emiliana cautiously. I'm fine. We need to split up the 40 men we have with us into search squads. Immediately. I want at least six different groups moving through this basilica. Vet, get them divided and ready to start searching. He said. Vetnek stood up straight from the wall and saluted. Aye, sir. He said before turning around to do as he had been ordered to. What are we looking for? The commissar? Asked Emiliana. And Stern nodded, his expression sour as another bead of sweat slipped down across the heavy lines of his face. Yes, but we aren't just looking for him anymore. We are apprehending him on sight. You two are with me and my group. Let's get moving. He said as he made for the door, fighting to keep his posture steady as the last few words he had heard echoed within his mind, like the dirge of a firing squad. They howled around her, cold against every inch of her being, freezing every fiber of her soul in a shockingly potent assault. The knight could feel her skin shiver, her sudden goosebumps painful against the damage on her skin, her body reacting as though she had been suddenly immersed in an ice bath. That sensation continued, no matter how hard she fought against it, sinking into every feature and crease, chilling her right down to her very spirit. It hurt just to exist within this struggle, a single mortal flame lost amidst a twister of black thoughts, emotions, and memories. The Jedi Master wrapped her arms around her own body, somehow holding herself together in the face of the warping onslaught, taking a moment to gather her strength before once more resuming her work. At the guiding command of her potent mind, Ayla's hands became scalpels, their every edge honed to razor precision. Visualization now firmly in hand, she briefly examined the tools of her craft before using them. The metaphorical blades glinted with a sharpness born of raw mental discipline, a discipline that she then turned on herself. Cut, snip, tear. Her face grew lined in her meditation as pain screeched across the surface of her thoughts. How could she do any of this precisely while in the midst of this attack? Under normal circumstances, she would have already torn herself mentally apart. The memories were not her own. That was her only saving grace in all of this madness, adding a single advantage to her labor as she worked. A mental surgeon attempting an intense and delicate operation, all while trapped within the howling winds of a metaphorical hurricane. Fortunately, she could stand to be less careful, less precise, at least up to a certain point. These memories were simply not hers, and the way they were affixed to her mind, her history, were unnatural and unattached to her actual life experience. Even so, she nearly lost many of those experiences, the moments that made her who she was as she struggled with the dark torrent that had been unleashed within her. Ayla did not engage with the memories. She only cut them away, going well beyond the technique of flash burning as she used the force itself to curb neurons within her very gray matter, physically disabling them, destroying the memories they held in their near entirety. But despite that, those same memories fought her like living things, forcing themselves into her mind's eye even as she tried to obliterate them, attempting to destabilize her focus and escape her clutches like slime-ridden fish. Normally, this kind of work was forbidden. And even when allowed, it was delicate, dangerous, and that was when supervised by other Jedi. But. Normally, it was not the memories of someone else whom she was purging, and that allowed her a semblance of leeway she could not have had otherwise, had they been personal experiences of her own. The alien memories tried to change that, trying to imprint themselves into secondary memories and thoughts, like missiles made of pure mental trauma, seeking where she was weakest before detonating within her skull, marking her. But. She contended with them every bit as harshly. Ayla had been mind-ravaged before, had been drugged on real spice until all she could remember was how to breathe, speak, and fear. 
She had been eroded and controlled by the dark side at the hands of Master Carco, had fed his dark ambitions while he turned her into his assassin, his pawn. She had been the puppet of traitors and the prey of fallen beings long before the Republic had encountered the Empire, and she had recovered each time, and each time she had grown stronger for it, more versed in the workings of her own mind with every effort made against it. The teachings of Master Plo Koon and the wisdom of Master Yoda echoed within her, joining her fight like reserves of hidden strength, now reinforcing her spinning thoughts. I am a Jedi, she said to herself as she lowered the blades to the surface of her mind again and again. And within me is the strength to overcome darkness. I am a Jedi, and I will not fall to this, she swore, knowing, or rather forcing herself to know, that this was the truth. Slice, tear, snip. Though she made jagged cuts in the memories, she was careful not to fear them such that she was willing to come too close to her own, making rough slices and leaving the vague rinds of the mind war that had been used against her there. She knew this tactic would not uproot every one of the horrible thoughts that wormed in her skull, but it would free her of most of them, and for the rest, well, the rest she would simply need to deal with. That was the price she would pay for engaging in this internal battle here, now, and at a rush. When at last she had done enough, her eyes flared open wide, colored red and yellow like flames in the night, before dulling and cooling into her natural hazel shading. Ayla's chest heaved, her breath rough and ragged, sweat slicking her entire body and stinging against the many blisters and small wounds that had found their way to her during the long day of battle. At once, she felt the stillness, the silence. And she knew that she was not flying any longer, though her eyes confirmed that she was still within the lat gunship, right where she had left herself. The Jedi's joints popped and clicked as she rose to her feet, feeling oddly frail, almost old and withered after her many exertions. How much more could she realistically expect of herself? How much farther could she take this? As far as I must, she breathed, answering her own doubting thoughts with pained determination. Ayla straightened fully, stretched her arms out for a brief moment, and then reached out with her hand opening one of the wall-mounted pockets within the ship with her mind. From it, she drew out a ration bar, which floated through the air into her hand. The Jedi tore it open, feeling her teeth ache as she chewed through the nutritious but foul-tasting meal, before walking to the front of the cabin and pressing her blue thumb against the red button she found there. Leadhead, I need a report, she said, forcing strength she did not feel into her voice. General. Good to see you're finally awake. Was getting a little worried. We've arrived. Commander Graves and the others have gone out to look for the Jedi. Uh, but things are not going smoothly, said the clone pilot. In what way? Ayla asked, taking a second and then third bite after she spoke. Well, for starters, there's blood everywhere, ma'am. Over everything. And it's not just blood looking stuff. It's real blood. We tested it. There aren't any civilians or Imperials either, and no sign of General Voss anywhere in the vicinity, he reported. Ayla felt a serpentine shiver entwine its way down her spine, the vague memory of something horrible rolling around behind her eyes. But it was now too weak, too incomplete, to affect her greatly. Bodies? She asked a moment later. We found some, mostly Imperial soldiers and clone troopers. Very few Jedi have been found, all dead, requiring prints or blood tests for positive identifications. If I had to guess, I'd say whatever happened down there turned into a big mess, said Leadhead. How many Jedi did you find? Ayla pressed. Only about 25, we think, was his response. You think? She asked back. Yeah, a few of them were less than intact, so there's a little guesswork in the actual count. The clone clarified. Ayla nodded her head, taking another bite of the now dwindling ration bar. Still, even if you found 30 bodies, that still isn't even a tenth of the Jedi who are with Master Voss and Master Coda. They must still be out there. Wait a second, you said there were clones as well. Clones from where? Under whose command? 
she asked suddenly. Um, well, yours, General, he said through the wall calm. These, were these the forces I sent with Commander 65? She asked incredulously. It appears so. We've ID'd a lot of troopers, but we haven't found the commander yet. Still, it is unmistakable. These are his men, said Leadhead. No wonder we lost our artillery support, Ayla said with a scowl, angrily slamming her free hand against the wall with an open palm. Uh, matter for another time. Right now, we need to focus on locating the other Jedi. Led, send me the coordinates for Captain Graves' current location. I'll meet up with him and head up the search personally from now on, she said. Aye, General. Just watch your step. It's a literal mess out there, he said, before suddenly the doors to the craft squealed and popped open, a ping appearing in Ayla's personal communicator a moment later. She turned and walked to the edge of the ship, and at once the Jedi Master could see that Leadhead had not been exaggerating. The opened doors revealed that the craft had been set down in the alcove of an alleyway just wide enough to fit the vehicle they had come in. Puddles of congealing blood glistened in the dim light, rippling as drips and drops splashed down into them from higher roofs, walkways, and buildings. Ayla scrunched her nose as the smell hit her, a metallic, rotting stench that was not unlike that of a charnel pit. The Jedi stepped out into it, not even bothering to try to avoid the unavoidable crusty slurry that coated everything around them for as far as she could see. Following the ping, she took off like a bark speeder, stepping lightly and hastily as she ran after Captain Graves, her every movement so swift that she was never in place long enough to catch the spattering blood she left in her wake. This whole section of the city was disturbingly silent, her rapid splashing steps echoing eerily between the many blood-drenched spires of this once shining segment of Azure City. She turned a corner where her ping led her, seeing another alleyway, this one far more narrow than the one they had parked their lat gunship in. There was no sign of Graves, or anyone else, and she entered in only a few steps before igniting her lightsaber, her eyes scanning the walls and shadowed spaces with a predator's intensity. Captain Graves? She called out into the alley, voice echoing between the shadows, which lengthened thanks to the blue glow of her blade. Ayla heard a noise to her right and spun, placing her blade before her as a compact dumpster opened up, lids squealing as it swung up and over. The Jedi's tension released as she saw the familiar helmet of the clone captain peer out at her, before he himself began to work himself free, brushing scrap and garbage off of himself once he was out. Clear. It's just the general. Graves said, and all around them, from windows, one other dumpster, and a manhole cover, the other members of Aquila's squad revealed themselves, coming out of hiding. Sorry about that, General, he said with a brief salute. Heard you're coming, and couldn't be sure it was you. Um, not to criticize, but I think a little more stealth is in order. We heard you running here almost a minute before you arrived, he said, and Ayla blushed slightly and nodded. Graves was right. The last thing she needed was to walk into another trap, but the logic of those thoughts only adhered for so long. Good call, Captain. What's the situation? She asked. Graves shrugged pointedly. I have most of the lads orbiting the area but keeping their distance. We cannot raise the other Jedi on comms, and we cannot find them on foot. No idea how everything here got so… red, but I doubt it means something good happened. He said, and Ayla nodded. It was the Red Storm, she said confidently. That must be where all this blood came from. Graves shrugged again. It's… it's real blood, General. We tested it. Human, Duro, Twi'lek, it's a big mix, but it's all definitely blood. How can a storm rain real blood like that? And why? He asked. Ayla shook her head. I don't know, Captain. Maybe it's a weapon meant to demoralize us. Or maybe it's something even more sinister. I doubt the answer is good news for us either way. Have you found any trails that might lead us to the other Jedi? She asked him. No. We spotted the tail end of a retreating Imperial force a little while back, but little else, he said. Ayla arched an eyebrow at that. What was that force doing here? Do you know? She asked. Graves shrugged again. It was mostly scattered and running. We did not pursue past what we needed to verify it. They are not carrying prisoners from what we could see, and they were not being actively pursued, though they sure were running like it. We doubled back to keep searching for the Jedi, but 
as you can see. Progress has been stagnant, he reported. What about you, General? Can you, uh, sense anything? Point us in a direction? The right direction? The commando asked. Ayla nodded. I think. Give me a moment, she said. The Jedi then took a deep breath and closed her eyes. Her mind was far from centered now. The traces of her memory were still haunting her every conceived thought, and she doubted she would be able to detect the presences she needed. At least, not in a conventional way. But, she and her former master Quinlan Voss had established a powerful force bond even during their first meeting, a bond which had only grown stronger throughout the many years working together. It was this bond she now sought out, finding it within the confines of her soul and pulling on it gently. If her master was alive, she would feel him. If he was not, well, she would feel that as well. To her temporary relief, she found the pull was taut, his own life still present and yet to become one with the Force. But soon after, she felt something else. A context that came with that revelation, and it killed any joy she felt from the discovery. He's… he's in trouble! She gasped, eyes opening. Who? Asked the captain. Master Voss, he's in pain, he needs our help, and likely the others do as well. We must go to them, now! She said, voice taut. General, if we move at pace, they'll hear us coming. The captain began to say, but she silenced him with a sharp wave of her hand. That is a risk we will need to take, Captain Graves. We will not last much longer if what I sense is true. I'll keep pace with you, but we must run. Are you ready? She asked. Ready, General. He confirmed, and she took off, the clones hot on her heels as Ayla followed the line of power which connected her and her former master together. They dashed across silent, dead avenues, boots crunching and splashing, breaking through the thin shells of coagulated blood which had formed over the stiller pools they traversed through. They could hear their own echoes, the sounds they made as they ran, and for the clone commandos, it was a nerve-wracking experience, one which exposed them to any enemy listening in. The sense of that only drove them on to run faster and faster, to get where they were going more quickly. But. For Ayla, the drive was entirely born from the feelings she was receiving from her friend and former teacher. She could hear him. He was screaming. He was being destroyed. Faster! She coaxed the clones who were already struggling to keep up. He won't last much longer. Faster! The commandos grit hidden teeth, muscles pumping and pushing off the ground not complaining or contesting her order even as she slowly began to outdistance them. The pain Quinlan was enduring was intense, horrifically so, but it also served to guide her right to him, like following a burning thread tied to her own heart. Even if he had been held on another planet, in an entirely different system, she would have felt this. She would have been able to follow it. Had she not already been exhausted, she likely would have felt it sooner and without even trying. He was getting closer and closer still. She turned a corner around a broad, curving road, and then up a series of stairs and embankments. So focused was her haste that she nearly ran face first into the crowd she found waiting for her at the top. Ayla Sakura pulled up short, saber out as eight other robed figures faced her, blades present and humming in the air, ready to strike. Master Ayla? said the central figure among the eight who confronted her. The Jedi woman sighed heavily in relief, lowering her blue blade and raising her free hand just as her clones arrived behind her, blasters out. It's okay. Stand down, they are Jedi, she ordered wearily, weakly smiling back at the beaming fish-like face of the Mon Calamari knight, Ikar Oki. The young Jedi was palpably relieved to see her, he and the other Jedi around him lowering their weapons at once. Oh, it's good to finally meet someone. But wait, are you not supposed to be leading the Cathedral Assault? He asked after a moment had passed. Ayla nodded. Master Windu joined us and has taken command of that attack, she explained. We came here looking for the other Jedi. Master Windu has determined that we should all gather before launching our final assault on the Imperial Fortress. Where are the others? Where is Master Voss and Master Coda? She asked, looking around but finding only the eight Jedi before her, and no more. All around them, however, were the remains of a battle, the one her clones had already come across. 
Imperial soldiers, clone troopers, and even a few scant Jedi lay in gory piles or bloody heaps around them. Some obviously killed by the weapons Ayla had already encountered, but others torn utterly apart, pieces of their bodies missing as though preyed upon by a Sando beast. Ikar shrugged helplessly. That is exactly what we are trying to find out, Master Ayla. He said, and Ayla noticed for the first time that there were no masters among the eight she saw here, only knights, and some very recent graduates at that. What do you mean? She asked, concern coloring her face as she came closer. No, never mind, we cannot stop. Follow me and tell me everything that has happened. We will speak as we run, she said, urging them forward as she again took the lead. Ahsoka, you can't be serious, Rex hissed. The Togruton warrior smirked from over her shoulder at him, a flicker of her old, impish demeanor dancing across her face. What's wrong, Rex? Afraid of a little skull droid? She asked sarcastically, communicating with him mostly through their comms as he and the others hung back somewhat. More afraid of the ambush it's probably leading us into. He grumbled through the earpiece Ahsoka wore, pressed under her right mantral. Oh, calm down, Rex. It's not leading us into a trap. It trusts me now, said Ahsoka brightly, stepping around the bodies and debris that were scattered across the ground. Dismembered limbs and disembodied organs, shattered metal, broken weapons, all burned by raw heat and friction, a grim halo plastered around the length of the dreadnought Ahsoka and the 501st had brought down on top of the Imperial forces. The smell was acrid, a mix of acidic chemicals and the almost appetizing scent of roasted meat, which somehow made it even worse. Ahsoka grimaced then, her grin melting as her stomach tightened, first with hunger and then with nausea, but she ignored the sensations to the best of her ability. It trusts you because you know some imperial words and aren't recognized as an alien by it? Uh, forgive my skepticism, Commander, but that's not a lot to go on, he said in return. Ahsoka rolled her eyes, following the hovering Imperial machine as it continued to guide them closer to the ship. Shortly after the rebels had departed, it had taken flight again and wasted little time in informing Ahsoka of the reason it was floating around looking for people. After a brief word with Rex, she had decided to take it up on its request. No, that's only the reason it would talk to me, she explained over the comms. It trusts me because I hid it from the rebels, she said back, holding her remaining short saber in her hand, but keeping it inactive. And did it actually say that, or are we just assuming? He added, grunting as he climbed over a small pile of wreckage. Ahsoka did not answer that time, glad that the distance between them hid the slight heat that burned her cheeks, since assuming was exactly what she was doing. But the imp droid had been clear on one thing. Someone was in trouble, they needed help, and one way or another, Ahsoka was going to do what she could. She didn't know how yet, didn't have a plan, but she had been trained by her master to do the right thing when it appeared, and to wing it when it did not. She didn't quite know which one she was doing now, but she had some faith that it would work itself out. Hopefully. Wait, is it taking us back inside the ship? Rex asked into her ear as they watched the floating machine hover its way through a large fissure in the hull, disappearing inside. Is it trying to get us to rescue the prisoners we already took? The captain added, though this time the former Jedi shook her head and responded. I don't think so. We've already moved all the prisoners off the ship, she said, pausing only a moment longer before waving the clones forward. Let's go, Rex, she calmed to him and the clone rolled his eyes, drawing his other pistol and nodding. Right behind you, he sent. The other clones following behind them also got their weapons ready, following after their captain and commander, but moving cautiously, obviously wary. The interior they found waiting for them was a dark, burnt-smelling mess of smashed floors and fried components, some of which sparked and hissed in the shadows, providing brief spurts of illumination, revealing the extent of the damage from time to time. The one steady light was that cast by the floating skull, who had paused ahead to wait, and then, once seeing Ahsoka enter, turned to continue. Machine, where are we going? 
She called to it, but in response it only gave the same answer it had given each time before. Priority Beta 12 personnel requires aid. Time priority is prime. Please follow closely. We are on the fastest route to your destination. It droned in the Imperial language. Ahsoka puffed out a frustrated breath, but did as it bade, swiftly outdistancing the clones who were meant to stay back anyway. The Imperial droid had no impediments thanks to its hovering ability, even as it crossed the encumbered chamber and smashed access tunnels that made up the length of the ship. For Ahsoka, it required acrobatics to keep up, and for the clones, who were not nearly so flexible, the going was much slower. By the time the machine led her to where it was going, Ahsoka and it were virtually alone. The thing stopped suddenly, hovering in the air and not progressing any further. It had halted before an enormous heap of wreckage, some of it obviously part of the dreadnought, but some she did not recognize at all, the style striking her as far distant from the sleek, cold architecture of the Confederacy. She came up to it and waited, but it made no further moves. Um, are we here? She asked, looking around at the enshadowed metal scrap all around her. Affirmative. It droned. Okay, so who exactly am I here to save? She asked, taking a step back and starting to wonder if this really was an ambush. In response, the droid tilted its head in the air, hovering slightly to the left, while brightening and broadening the light which emanated from one of its eyes. The spot of illumination struck the wall and made Ahsoka jump in sudden surprise as an enormous metal eye was unexpectedly lit up before them. The beam of light widened and widened further, gradually revealing an entire armored face that was far larger than Ahsoka's entire body. The dented, crushed, and leering face of a hateful but dead war machine. It had been smashed under the ship, she realized. It was one of her own victims a single example of the many which had fallen prey to the maneuver Echo had performed. It lay propped up, mostly on its chest, one massive mechanical hand extending out before its face, slightly open, the other arm trapped and hidden under the bulk of the CIS dreadnought, as was most of the rest of its body. Whoa, that's a, that's a big droid, she said as she watched it, cautiously walking towards it, staring into its dead gaze. I'm not sure I can rescue this machine, she said into the air, eyes still stuck to it as she spoke. Night walker recovery optionally optimal. Night operator recovery imminently possible and required. It stated to her, keeping its light steady. Wait, you mean there's a person inside this? Trapped? She asked incredulously. Affirmative. Was the quick response. Ahsoka did a double take wondering how anything could survive that kind of crash. The only thing she could imagine that would explain it was that the ship was hollow and the hull of the huge walker was at least as tough as the bottom of the dreadnought's skin, like a nail being driven up through a boot. Even then, however, she doubted the thing was recoverable, crushed as it was. Okay, show me how to get inside this thing. She said, and in response, the spotlight the servo skull was emitting moved up from the face of the large war machine to the crushed hatch which lay above it. Right. She grumbled, seeing how high up it was, even with the machine smashed into the ground. Gripping her lightsaber more tightly, Ahsoka braced herself like a coiling spring and leapt, jumping up onto the machine's exposed open hand, landing on its tallest finger, and then leaping up from there to land on its head. From that spot, she jumped once more, landing on the lip of the hatch as she grabbed onto a handhold she found there, steadying herself before looking carefully at the damaged entryway. It had been crushed into place, for while the torso of this machine had resisted the impossible forces above it mightily, it had not been so resilient as to maintain its original shape, thus jamming the exit. She flipped her lightsaber around and lightly banged the butt of the weapon against the surface of the hatch signaling her presence with three loud taps. Ahsoka waited briefly then, before hearing three taps returned back to her, confirming that someone was still alive inside the walker. Instinctively, Ahsoka turned on her lightsaber, angling it forward once more and driving it into the edge of the hatch. Performing the act nearly pushed herself off the machine entirely, its metal skin fully resisting Ahsoka's strike. 
Wow! She cried out, swinging briefly from the handle she held, one foot still pinning her to the lip of the hatch before she swung back and retrieved her balance. The frag is this thing made of? She said aloud, pressing her saber against the same point again, but this time more carefully, watching as her blade of blue light was held back and repelled. It was like Firk or Beskar steel, only slowly heating and melting against the persistent press of the lightsaber. She pushed against it more strongly, gritting her teeth as she attempted to slide the weapon in before finally backing off with a frustrated sigh. Well, that's not going to work. Ahsoka grumbled, stowing the weapon on her belt and rubbing her chin as she considered how else to approach this. I guess I do know one more thing that might do the job, Ahsoka said to herself before bracing and jumping off the lip of the hatch and landing back on the top of the finger again. The young, former Jedi steadied herself, making sure her perch was solid, and then raised her hands, palms facing the crumpled entrance of the walker. Ahsoka Tano then narrowed her eyes and began to focus, reaching deep within herself in order to coax the Force into action. She had never been the best telekinetic, with Master Obi-Wan often showing her up in practical demonstrations. But it greatly helped that she was not in the midst of battle while attempting what she was doing, putting her all into the effort. The metal began to quiver and then to shake, rattling and squealing as she gripped it with her metaphysical power and began to try to pull. But it was clearly not easy. The metal resisted her every step of the way, screeching at her every progress and only bending reluctantly to her will. The task was such that, twice, Ahsoka was forced to pause and catch her breath, sweat dripping from her montrals as she tried again and again. Okay. Okay. One more. She panted as she raised her arms again for the third try. She made her extended fingers into claws as she grit her teeth mightily and closed her eyes, face scrunching under the tension. The metal creaked. Bolts popping free and drowning out the sounds of her drawn-out, effortful groan. Come on... Come on... Just... a little... more... Ahsoka gasped between her clenched teeth, until, suddenly, and with one last metallic screech of defiance, the hatch was torn away! The force pulling on it being so great, it propelled the dislodged metal plate into the opposite wall, firmly embedding it there. The former Jedi gasped in relief, dropping her arms limply to her sides and falling onto her rear, legs draped over the side of the large metal finger she had been standing on. Ahsoka barely kept enough balance not to fall off the raised digit and into the huge palm of the machine itself, hands grasping the finger to keep her anchored as she started to slide head almost spinning from the exertion. She wiped her forehead, catching her breath as she looked up at the now open hatch, still illuminated by the skull. An Imperial soldier wiggled and wormed his way out of the crushed confines, almost falling out before catching himself with the same handhold Ahsoka had used before on her first attempt. Thank the throne! The young man gasped, almost hanging from the handhold limply before carefully making his way down the side of the war machine using whatever he could reach to gingerly descend. Ahsoka watched him carefully, noticing that he was armed with a holstered pistol and a sheathed knife strapped to his outer thigh. More than that, however, she saw that he was clearly injured, taking his time as he descended down the wreckage. Well, you can thank me too if you like. Ahsoka panted, getting up and flipping herself gracefully down into the palm of the hand, speaking in her best Imperial. Yes, of course! The imp added in response to her words, lowering himself to the ground and limping forward to greet her. Thank you! Throne bless you! I, I thought I'd be trapped in there forever! He said, shielding his eyes from the light that the servo skull was shining, but stumbling out of the luminous cone quickly. And thank you too, Bofin! I owe you my life twice now. Uh, he began to say as his eyes adjusted, biting off his own words when he finally got a good look at Ahsoka. She noticed right away, and raised her hands placatingly, holding no weapon in them. Now hold on, I just saved your- She began to say, stepping back as she watched his face twist at the sight of her orange skin and prominent head tails. Xenos! He almost screamed, his voice cracking as his hands snapped down to a holster on his belt. 
smoothly drawing out the pistol held there, moving from trained reflex. Ahsoka's hand snapped down as well, equally trained, but not as quick on the draw as the imp soldier. Get back! Die! He yelled in a frenzy, hands shaking around his gun. He fired, his first shot going wide to the left, causing Ahsoka to flinch to the right, though his second shot would have lanced her through the lower right of her chest if she had not drawn and activated her lightsaber, moving even as he was firing his first shot. The second beam of light was deflected off the blade she used to intercept it, sending the quick ray into the sparking ceiling. The young man fired twice more, Ahsoka rolling and ducking just barely out of the way, coming up to her feet in a ready stance, prepared to retaliate. The Tegruta snapped out her other hand, pulling the pistol from the soldier's trembling grip, catching it firmly by the barrel. But he didn't stop, reaching down to his lower left thigh and drawing out his combat knife. Flipping the blade into a reverse grip, his eyes wide and frenzied with obvious fear, even as he charged at her with the weapon raised. He began to yell, running for Ahsoka before being caught in the back and knocked unconscious by a brilliant blue ring of energetic light. The Jedi sighed and shook her head at the young imp as he fell face first into the ground. The attack that had caught him by surprise was one Ahsoka recognized without actually having to see the clone who fired it. Captain Rex and his team finally arriving as they pushed aside a fallen metal beam that stood between them and their commander. The captain had issued forth his blast from one of his pistols, firing while still behind the pillar they now shifted aside. The servo skull began to beep wildly then, releasing the same alarm it had before, but only for a few seconds before Rex silenced it by firing another ring into the floating machine, causing it to drop to the ground with a hefty clang. Rex! Ahsoka said, half relieved by his arrival and half frustrated by his shot at the Imperial droid. What? It was a stun blast! He said, walking over and looking down at the groaning, unconscious Imperial soldier. Besides, I told you it was an ambush. He added, pushing the young man over with his boot and kicking away the combat knife, which spun off and embedded itself a half inch into the metal wall it hit afterwards. Rex couldn't help but notice, shaking his head. How the frag do they get the knives that shop? He grumbled to himself. It wasn't an ambush. Ahsoka corrected, drawing his attention back. He was trapped inside that thing, she said, pointing to the massive machine and causing several of the clones to step back in shock once they angled their own rifle-mounted flashlights at its face. And that's how he thanked you for it? The clone captain asked sarcastically. To that, Ahsoka nodded with a defeated sigh. He attacked as soon as he realized I wasn't human. I couldn't even get a word in. He just went berserk, she said, shaking her head. <laughs> Rex laughed, causing Ahsoka to narrow her eyes at him. And what's so funny about that? She asked, Rex shaking his head. Nothing really, it's just... <laughs> these imps are so backwards, even their droids are more reasonable than their troopers. He said with a half-hearted shake of his head. Ahsoka couldn't exactly argue with that, breathing heavily as she walked over to the skull and picked it up, seeing lights flickering in its lensed eyes, the small clamps underneath its body hesitantly clicking and twitching. Well, let's not let this go to waste, she said. See if you can't salvage something from this thing. Some records or weapons to bring back. The former Jedi ordered to her troopers. Right, said Rex, waving his men forward, who began to climb up the huge machine, working their way up towards the burst hatch. I assume we're taking this one too? He asked a moment later, aiming down at the Imperial with his pistol. The former Jedi nodded her head almost absently. Yes, he's our prisoner now, she said, turning away from the troopers as they scaled the machine and looked back towards Rex. You know, I could have handled him even if you hadn't shown up, she said, a slight mocker's grin creasing her face. Yeah, yeah, Rex responded, rolling his shoulders. All I know is that General Windu isn't going to be happy to hear about another prisoner, he said as he stared down at the defeated imp. Make that too, called one of the clones near the hatch. We've got another one in here, a droid woman. She's unconscious, looks pretty roughed up, said the same trooper. Good, like you said, Rex, the droidified ones have been the most sensible so far. It can't hurt to take her as well, said Ahsoka. At that, the clone commander shook his head derisively and scoffed. Sensible? 
The last one you talked to killed my men and nearly fried you like an egg, Rex said, some exasperation working its way into his voice. I know, she said, face darkening at the recollection. But he did it to escape our custody, something we'd probably do in his shoes. And he let me live when he didn't have to, she added. So what? Rex asked. So what? I've been shown less mercy by the Confederacy, said Ahsoka, but Rex clearly wasn't buying into it. He still killed my men, Ahsoka. I'm glad he left you alive, Commander, I really am. But that doesn't mean- Rex began, but Ahsoka cut him off. What it means is that there is something there, Rex. Some chance to figure this out. He didn't kill me, and he could have. That may not sound like much to you, but it's... It's a bigger deal than you think. She snapped. She raised her hands and gestured around herself. Look at this war. It's not a war any of us need or want. These are not separatists. We never negotiated with them. They never made a choice to break off from us. We don't know anything about them. The young Tragruta argued. With all due respect, Commander, we know enough. Rex snapped back. They came here and started killing indiscriminately. They're specious, imperialists, and warmongers. They're animals! He railed. They are terrified! Ahsoka shouted back. You can't feel the Force, so it's not as obvious for you. She said, gesturing towards the Imperial at their feet. But when he attacked me, he did it because he was scared. When we were fighting the droidmen on the ship, they were afraid of me. Of me! I can't even remember the last time I met someone who was afraid of me before even seeing what I could do. All of these Imperials, they think they have a good reason for fighting us like this. They're more shocked to be taken alive than to be killed by us. That means something. She almost yelled. Even if it does, what reason can justify acting like monsters? Rex asked in return, matching her intensity. That they think we are the monsters. Ahsoka retorted, turning away to look at the dead face of the Imperial War Machine. They think we're even worse than they are, she said, voice calming. And it's up to us to show them they are wrong. We have to not be the monsters they fear, or else we will justify everything they are doing. If we fight them the way they are fighting us, then this war isn't going to end, not anytime soon, she said, eyes still fixed on the huge walker. And how the frag do we do that? Asked Rex. Ahsoka turned back to face him, face lined with the obvious strain of the question. I don't know yet, she admitted, looking away before matching his gaze again. But it starts with talking, and we can't talk to dead people, she said before bending down and starting to heft the soldier up. So help me with him. Do you have any binder cuffs left? <laughs>